Good morning, and welcome, welcome to a cultural discussion that also brings in business. And uh, we're talking about the value of art. We all know the history of art somewhat. We know about the Medici's, we know about the great warlords that uh, collected art, that had their own artists, that um, created styles. We're all familiar with that. Well, we're not going to delve into the history of art today. We're going to discuss about what's happening right now. And uh, before I engage the wisdom of these panelists, I just wanted to make a couple of comments because I'm, I'm the moderator, and, uh, but I do have a couple of views. And uh, with Timothy, I'm, I'm the director of the American Folk Art Museum in New York City. We have a wonderful collection, but it's a very small museum. Timothy represents a marvelous collection and one of the most important museums in the world. And although we are different in that way, there are many uh, views about uh, art and collecting art and the role of museums that we share. So that I'm totally placing my trust in Timothy when he discusses the views of museums. Um, the folks that we have here today represent a range of, of course, museums, collecting, galleries, investment, and also the auction world and some of the thorny issues that uh, we're all facing in the world of collecting. I think the best way uh, to start is to talk a little bit about what these individuals see as their role in this world and also some of the things that they would like to, uh, uh, to emphasize. I want to begin first with a collector, with Jane Nathanson, because a collector in many ways is the person who um, sets the tone. It is a role of passion. Uh, it is often a lifelong commitment. So Jane, I want to throw this to you. You are a member of the board of the LA County Museum. You are an amazing collector. Why did you do this? Why are you doing this? Um, you know, you took the words out of my <laughs> mouth when you said passion. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in New York City in a family that collected art. And part of our daily life was always going to museums, looking at art. And in, it sort of enriched our spiritual life. It decorated our home. It was something that really gave us a lot of pleasure and taught us a lot about history, I think, looking at art from all different perspectives and all different ages. Um, I was an art major. Today, by the way, I'm a psychologist, so I've veered away from, from just being a collector or being involved in the art field. But psychologically speaking, I think um, collecting art almost becomes an addiction because it gives you such a pleasure and such a high when you find something that you love and that you enjoy looking at. And I'm coming from a little bit of a different perspective than most people on the panel in that we do not buy art uh, as an investment. We buy it because we love it. We think it's culturally important and it will eventually end up in a museum, either here or somewhere else in the world, where I think everybody can enjoy it because I think art is loaned to us. But prices of art. When my husband and I started collecting art in New York, there was sort of one dominant school, and that was the New York School of Pop Art. And we were very fortunate to be friendly with a wonderful gallerist who guided us, who had been a friend of my father's, Leo Costelli. And he represented people like Andy Warhol and Lichtenstein and Jasper Johns and, and on and on, you know, all the iconic painters of the 60s. And having grown up with a collection of impressionistic art, he forced me as a young person, he said, when you buy art by a living artist, don't go back in history, go forward in history. And he forced us to look at a Campbell soup can and a picture of Marilyn or Elvis 
as, in a totally different light, in a totally different way. So um, we were very fortunate. We started collecting when it was very affordable. I think our first Warhol cost us $1,000, and we couldn't believe we were going to break the bank with that purchase. Mm -hmm. And um, today I don't have to tell you what some of these, <laughs> these paintings are worth. Um, but we have continued to collect. And um, when I came to LA, I was very surprised there was no contemporary art museum. So I worked with a group of other people and founded the Museum of Contemporary Art, today known as MOCA, and also sit on the board of LACMA, which is an encyclopedic museum. And um, I think without culture in a city, without people appreciating art and artists, um, a civilization begins to decline. And I think that LA now has joined the rest of the world, not only as the movie capital, which is a form of art too, but also as an art capital. And with the expansion of LACMA, um, this city is just blossoming and becoming sort of the place mm -hmm. well, for new art to emerge. Thank you. You, you mentioned Leo Castelli. Uh, we have Deborah McLeod here, who is the director of the Gagosian Gallery, and I would say a very powerful position. So as the gallerist here and as the person who perhaps guides some of these uh, wonderful people who want to collect, I mean, what do you see your role as being? Well, the role of the uh, gallerist is primarily an exhibitor. So we are in the business of putting forward uh, artists' work. We do six to eight exhibitions per year, maybe six weeks or so each exhibition, and then a week or so to uh, turn from one exhibition to the next. I work for a very ambitious uh, man, Larry Gagosian, who is well known for his courage <laughs> and uh, for really presenting great artists in any way they'd like to be presented. Um, Richard Serra, for instance, where you have works of art that are many, many tons. You might have to take the roof off your building to crane the thing in. And um, so we are very ambitious exhibitors. I run the Beverly Hills Gallery, one of now, I, depending on how you count, I think we're 17 galleries now around the world, which is unique, and uh, very much Larry's um, vision. Mm -hmm. And so we, we represent our artists. If you're unfamiliar with the gallery system, it might be like an agent represents an actor. And that agent's job is to get that actor the very best jobs. Not any job, but the most high quality job and the job that will advance the artist's career. So we're working, we want to place art. We, we say we place it, not sell it. So for instance, if I could sell something to the Nathansons, <laughs> that's pretty much my first choice because they're great custodians. It puts that artwork in the context of a great collection. And I know there's a good chance it's going to LACMA <laughs> at the end of the day. So that's kind of the best case scenario. Um, the worst case scenario is uh, selling art to someone who uh, is buying it in a hurry, not really paying attention, thinks it might be an investment, and is going to drop kick it to the next person as soon as they get uh, some appreciation in the artwork. Then we haven't done our job for the artist mm -hmm. or for the market. And then, in the, so the artist is one thing, and then the collectors is the other side of it. And you know, so as you can see, it's a whole, it's a relationship business, mm -hmm. and the collectors are really so much fun. I've been doing this for a really long time <clears throat> and have grown up with many of the collectors like the Nathansons in the community and um, it's extremely rewarding. People who collect modern and contemporary art tend to be very curious, tend to have kind of a fierce passion and it makes it so much fun and it really is what separates it from other assets. Of course, art is in an asset class at a certain category, it certainly is. But the, the fun of it is the pursuit and um, the collectors who are probing and looking for what's happening and want to be in artist studios and want to be taught, want their worlds busted wide open. And this is what makes it such a thrilling pursuit. So we're exhibitors and we have artists and collectors. Well, That's I, the picture. I know we'll come back to you because uh, there are lots of questions that people have about galleries. But now I'm going to turn to Timothy Potts, who's the director of the Getty Museum. 
What do you think, Timothy? Well, we, we have, of course, in a, as a museum, we're in a very different position than um, private collectors, although there are some links. We do care about and worry about the price of art, um, but, of course, that's when we're buying. Uh, we do occasionally sell, but that's really a matter of housekeeping. And the point we would, the ideal museum would be one which gets to the point where everything they are, they wouldn't want to even consider ever selling anything they have because it's all of such high quality and importance. So our approach to the value is, I mean, the, the financial value is, is nice to know that the, the value of works goes up, but that is not part of what we're here to do. Um, and in fact, the only time we think about it is if we're lending works and we need them an insurance valuation uh, as the basis for the loan. Otherwise, of course, it isn't something we talk about or think about day to day. Um, we do worry if we've got enough money to buy the next work, but, mm -hmm. but that's, as I say, we're exclusively on the buy side. Mm -hmm. um, but the value that really we're concerned with is the value that doesn't attach to ownership and doesn't attach to its financial value, but the importance, the role that it can play um, in a meaningful way in people's lives, in society, in the education system, in um, the experience that people can have living in the city of LA and in fact through the internet around the world. So that's how we measure the value of what we do. Um, we put a lot of investment into it, not only through the works we acquire, but the programs we build around them and uh, our education, pro our K through 12, we spend nearly a million dollars a year um, providing buses for Title I schools to be, for the, the students in Title I schools to be bused to the Getty, to have guided, instructed tours around the museum and can have an experience of great works of art at the, at the highest level and begin to understand um, how that relates to history, how it relates to other things they might be learning about at school. So that's the meaning and importance that we're trying to achieve. Uh, it's maximizing access to great works of art that can have a meaningful impact on people's lives, can be, in some cases, transformative. The people, some of us sitting here today, it, it was going to museums, learning about it at school, then going to museums and studying at university. That became our whole lives, professionally, personally, and in almost every other sense. Mm -hmm. um, and all the evidence, you know, the studies that are done, and also educationally, in terms of students who are exposed to areas of activity which are intrinsically creative, where they're not about learning a process in a mechanical way, but learning about art, being, a, being and also encouraged to um, try their hand at something which is um, creative. It doesn't have to be the visual arts, or it can be the film industry, it can be um, uh, being creative in writing and so on. But all the evidence suggests this really is what, something that unleashes an aspect of people's um, abilities that can pay dividends way beyond the art world per se in all other many other areas of activity. So we want to be as meaningful a part of that process for ourselves, for the community of Los Angeles, for visitors to this part of the world and around the world as we possibly can be. And the uh, but I'll finish by saying one area in which it does loop back to financial value is the impact that has on the city that museums like the Getty, LACMA, the fact that we have the Getty, LACMA, the Norton Simon, Huntington, Mocha, and so on. And LA isn't always perceived, the first thing about LA that you might think as a foreigner or someone living outside California is the movie industry, not the museums. But the cities that do have the image of being great centers of art and culture, Paris, London, uh, the others around the world that you all know about. That's a huge part of the tourist industry, which of course is a hu that becomes a major part of the local economy. And we have over, uh, we're having now f something like 50 million tourists uh, passing through Los Angeles a year. Um, and cultural attractions, the movie studios, the museums, um, the experience of LA, its architecture. This is an increasing part of why people come to this part of the world. So it does have payoffs. They're not, as it were, built into our mission. They're a wonderful fringe benefit, but they are an important part, I think, of the, if you like, the justification for government support, foundation support, uh, and private support of these institutions by philanthropists like the Nathansons. I'd like to t turn to uh, Philip right now. Uh, you started the Fine Arts Fund, and in a way, you're, you're one of the big guys in all of this. And this f financial 
twist, if you will, is, is fascinating and I'm sure would be of great interest to our entrepreneurs in the audience. So. Um, the world's press like to write about me as the, um, the bad boy of the art market. Um, the guy who trades five or ten million dollars a week in art, uh, whether it be a Picasso or a Degas or a Christopher Wool or a Damien Hirst or a Wade Guyton. Um, we, I started this business having been 12 years at Christie's and I got into Christie's by accident uh, in 1989 and became finance director when I was 27. And I saw some of the big collectors um, who were buying art, remember one of my friends bought a Canaletto for 50,000 pounds and sold it for a million pounds 15 years later and bought a Monet for $100,000 and sold it for $3 million uh, 15 years later. And I thought, you know, it's interesting. They were, there was a big correlation between the property guys, guys in property and people who were buying art. And they were looking at art as not only as a great thing to own and a great thing to be passionate about, but actually a great store of wealth and a way of making possibly more money than anything else they've ever done. Uh, and so I picked on that theme and I moved on actually to becoming deputy CEO of Christie's. And then I left to set up, found and, and set up the Fine Art Fund group. And it's now being branded as the Fine Art Group because we do a huge number of things now in the art market. We're the biggest art investment group in the world. We now become the biggest art advisory or one of the top five art advisory groups in the world. We're going to be lending hundreds of millions of dollars against art all over the world. Um, we advise two or three of the world's biggest collectors. To give you some idea, one or two of them buy 30 million of art a month on art. Uh, and we organize some of the most prominent exhibitions that are lent free of charge to museums. So the bad boy has got involved in all sorts of areas of the market. And it's a very, very interesting market because I stood on the podium with the mayor of Paris and the minister of culture in, in Paris, France, and they said it's all about passion. Um, buying a picture is just about passion. And um, I was so annoyed listening to this um, comment when Unfortunately, in order to buy much of this art, you need an awful lot of money. And today, to buy a great collection, to buy a collection that we perhaps are talking about, you might have to spend 50 million, 200 million, a billion. One of my friends said it's not worth entering the market because I can't build a great collection because I need a couple of billion to get in there. Now, what we do is we help collectors access the market and demystify the complexities of walking into Sotheby's or Christie's or Gagosian because you've got no idea why is a picture worth a million or 50,000 or whatever it is. Um, are there, they, the gallery might say this is a unique piece and this is the last one and then quite often they take me around the back and say well we've got 15 others if the fine art fund are interested. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've got to be very savvy when you're entering this market and my job is to make the world's most important collectors, the, the investors, uh, the people who are entering this market understand what they're going into. And so what we are, we're the architect, the surveyor, the engineer for somebody in, in going into the art market, the equivalent of what they do in the property market. We guide them through and demystify the entire art world and say, do you know that's not actually factually true? Here are the facts. And we do this day in, day out from the 15th century artworks to the 21st century. We represent 123 families in 23 countries from China to the Middle East to the US to London and so on. So that's a quick overview. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, you're saying people need to know what they're buying and they need to understand. Uh, I feel we have to do equal time. You started at Christie's. Now let's turn to Sotheby's. <laughs> and Lucien, you, uh, you and I discussed what does it make to be a good steward? And, and I think it's very important to, to go over that. And also, I'd love for you just to give a, a, an overview of some of the things you do at Sotheby's, because you're also involved with protecting some of the great works of art in the world. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, as I've been at Sotheby's for 21 years. Uh, I started as a lawyer. And since then, I've become a business person uh, working with private collectors here in the United States working with provenance issues, and helping to sell some of the most important artworks which have come to market in recent years. Uh, and as, as many people know, the job of an auction house is to broker sales from maybe private collectors or institutions on one side to buyers on the other. 
20, 30, 40 years ago, we were just bare commission agents. We'd sell things more or less wholesale, mm -hmm. and it was a very simple business. Uh, now we're, we're much more like Gagosian, uh, and we have auctions of tens of thousands of artworks a year, but we curate. So rather than blindly taking in artworks and trying to sell them for the highest price, we will also try to place them and educate our clients. Um, so for instance, we have sales coming up in New York in two weeks' time. Uh, we have contemporary art, we have American paintings, we have Impressionist paintings, and our job is to try to curate those sales and to produce shows which in a way resemble Deborah's shows at Gagosian mm -hmm. uh, and help people to understand the importance of the artworks concerned. Um, I take slight issue with what Philip said earlier, and for me, it is all about passion. Uh, I've been at Sotheby's 21 years, as I said, and I'm still in, the, in this role because every day I get excited by a new artwork. Every day I'm excited by explaining to a client, explaining to a collector why a Canaletto, a Renaissance sculpture, uh, a Mark Rothko is so exciting and why it would form a part of their life. Uh, and for me, it's not, it is partly a question of investment, but it's also a question of if, if everything fell to pieces, would you still derive enjoyment from this work of art? Would it still improve your life? Mm -hmm. And you asked me about custodianship. Um, Sotheby's is uh, quoted on the NYSE. Uh, well, I think we're the oldest company quoted on the New York Stock Exchange. And as such, we are bound by ethics from the market, um, international ethics and, and requirements of the US government and other governments. Um, but also, we are very conscious of our place in the worldwide art community. Uh, we were talking earlier about um, the danger that the international art market might transact in artworks looted from Syria or by the Islamic State. Uh, so for 20 years now, we've had checks and balances in place to minimize the risk we might accidentally help looting of antiquities or the despoilation of uh, sites. We have the same for heritage from Italy, from Greece, and so on. So we very much see ourselves as, as part of the global art community as well as being simple brokers. I'm, there are probably people in the audience who are thinking about buying art or sort of jumping in. And I'm wondering, are there protections for people entering the art market? One of the things that uh, uh, I found interesting in some of the points that, that you made in our earlier discussion, you said uh, we help the artist uh, be represented in the best possible way. Um, how do you select an artist? How do you decide this person is worthy of the kind of attention that you really have to give to, to move that person along? And what does it mean for someone who is not knowledgeable about this particular artist? How, uh, how do they feel if they've made a bad investment, let's say? I mean, mm -hmm. wh what do you do? How do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Well, to your question about how the artist gets selected, um, in the gallery world, the artists, we used to call them a stable, um, don't really use that term anymore because the artists move around a bit in a way that they didn't used to before, but it's the personal vision of the dealer, so in this case it's Larry's choice. Mm -hmm. And his taste runs towards classic art. We represent a portion of the Picasso estate, um, Richard Serra, Jeff Koons, Ed Ruscha, a lot of very big names that you know, um, classic post-war and modern. Mm -hmm. But uh, Larry also likes to keep the program interesting. We don't want to get boring. So we also do have young mid-career artists in the program. And we're, that, I think, is very challenging and fun and engaging to be looking for these artists. I've often suggested Larry look at an artist. And he'll say, I think that's a good artist, but I don't think it works in our program. So he's looking for a big picture that makes his brand. And it's you know, quite particular. And um, he's right. Um, it turns out to be right that um, artists seem to fit mm -hmm. in the program. And some are, we don't really have y super young artists. I always say we don't do pediatrics. You know, I'm not looking at master programs to look for very, very young artists. Some people do that. It's a special skill. 
but we tend to add artists to the program when they've probably been working for 10 years, 15 years, and they are launching into their mid-career stage. Mm -hmm. um, um, and your other question well, was, uh, oh, bad, bad, mistakes? Yeah, bad mistakes? Well, mistakes, I guess, get made, and the question is, what's a mistake? You know, if you bought something that you really love, and five years later it hasn't gone up, and you still love it, I don't think that's a mistake. I think you need to be managing your expectations <laughs> there and decide maybe, you know, maybe the worst case scenario is you buy it and assume at the time it's going to be worth nothing and buy it and enjoy it. Maybe then you'll be pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. But if you're spending lots of money, if you're spending millions of dollars, of course, you must do your due diligence and you do your very best to do your homework. I, I was, it's like going to college. Make friends and do your homework. You know, it's a relationship business. We will all talk to you. We will all talk to you till we're blue in the face. You can have a consultant that you hire um, who does a great job of helping you narrow the market, sort through things, help you discover what you want to do. I think it's a great, and you can do it lots of ways, but probably better than just shooting randomly at anything that looks interesting mm -hmm. to kind of focus in an area, gain expertise, kind of get in a lane and swim mm -hmm. is probably a great way to make a collection. Mm -hmm. And um, the more expensive it is, probably the more due diligence you need to do. But there are people that will talk to you. There are museum people. Tim Potts will talk to you. You know, they're not, these people are not unavailable. They have PhDs in their fields, and they love nothing more than talking to the members of their community who they hope will give things to their museum someday about their areas. Yeah. Um, also, you you know, there's Artnet and lots of databases now that can give you comps, we call them, comparables. Mm -hmm. But you have to pay careful attention, too, because uh, what looks like a comparable might not be, actually. Mm -hmm. There might be a condition issue or a provenance issue you're not aware of. So you want to make your relationships, and you do the best you can. If you're buying young artists, 90 of the 100 are not going to gain in value. Mm -hmm. if you're buying... Could, yes. I, could, I, could I pick up on the um, dichotomy, the idea that there's a dichotomy between the sort of passion-driven approach to collecting and the smart, analytical, if you like, financial approach? Um, if you think about the really great collections that have been built up in the, uh, during the course of the 20th century, overwhelmingly, these have been people who collected because of they, became, they, they, they developed a great love and passion for what they were doing. And often it was at the level as we're, the, when Picasso's, you could buy a Picasso for a few thousand dollars. So it wasn't always, uh, in fact, it was usually not at great prices, particularly for modernist things. These were very affordable, you know, in the 20s, 30s and beyond. And it was, you know, overwhelmingly the passion that drove things that weren't. It, they couldn't flip them a year later or three years later and quadruple their money. It wasn't happening that way. The, the, the prices were fairly stable and they weren't looking for that return. If it happened, fine. But it, what we weren't talking huge amounts of money. Um, even today, and I don't know any of the really major great collectors today who, are, who in my view, are driven primarily by a financial mm -hmm. motive. Even if they started, they might have been financial people who got into the art world and started collecting, let's say, old masters. They get the bug. Mm -hmm. It becomes an obsession, and they spend increasingly more time on their collection and their collecting than they do on their financial activities, <laughs> and they can't give it up. So at some point, it seems to me, the passion has to come into play. Or if it doesn't, those aren't the people who end up with great collections. They sometimes end up with meaningful, good, worthy collections. Mm -hmm. But I can't think of any of the really top collectors today. Mm -hmm. Philip may have some that are anonymous and we don't know about. But in my world, the passion is absolutely central. Mm -hmm. I agree, I, hand in hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I, think, I think Go ahead, Philip. You know, the, the, the passion starts, but once a collector starts finding out that his Warhol has gone from 3,000 to 3 million, or in the case of a friend of mine, from 120,000 to 42 million in 15 or 20 years, um, they suddenly get excited, and they suddenly think they know it, and they suddenly start thinking, maybe I ought to look at, at what my collection's worth. And most of my major collectors know exactly what their collection's worth. And they, the amount of people that turn up at Sotheby's and Christie's and sitting tracking the value of their collection because of a Monet or a Christopher Wool that's just come up for sale and is similar to theirs. They all want to know what it's worth. The world's moved on. 
Passion was a great power play originally in the art market, but it's changed dramatically. You, you have to combine the two very carefully. And if, if a client finds out that he paid a million dollars for something that's worth $10,000, he's going to be upset, even though he loves the picture. Um, and and uh, so all that homework and involvement, uh, the, the whole art market has completely changed in the last 15, 20 years. And, and it's, when I first started at Christie's 25 years ago, it was all about passion, no mention of art investment. And when we came into the business, started talking about money and, money and art, the business has, maybe sadly, maybe wrongly, has changed dramatically. And, and people are looking at how much money they're making in art, how valuable their collections are, tax write-offs when you gift your art collection to a museum. It all comes into play. Mm. Well, I, I, very okay. quick point. For the okay. But the, the real collector is the one you say, they buy something for a million, they find out it's worth 10,000. The real collector is still going to buy the next painting. Mm. If they're in there as a financial, then your sort of person you're talking about might be disillusioned and get out of the market and probably should. Mm. But the real collectors go on. They can afford to lose. They know that some will go up, some will go down. Mm -hmm. But that's what they keep in the market because they can't do anything else. Mm -hmm. I wanted to turn to the contemporary field. And Jane, I'd like you to jump in. Just well, one, let me just make one point. Uh, I've noticed uh, in the sort of changing chairs of museum directors, there's always a cycle, usually five or six years, you see some people moving around. I've noticed in, in, in reading about the new directors, most of them are geared towards contemporary mm. art. So what does that tell you? Hopes, joys, and fears that maybe Jay Nathanson might come to their museum and, <laughs> and donate. But really, what I'd, I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. And also, I, I want to bring Lucienne in uh, also uh, from the, from the uh, auction house standpoint of the prices that are coming up for contemporary. I, I just, before I do yeah. that, I, I just wanted to comment a little on the, on the previous conversation. You know, I do feel it is in any market, buyer beware and educate yourself. Because the whole gestalt of collecting art has really changed, as you say, in the last 20, 30 years, where people bought art to put a pretty picture above their sofa in their living room and it gave them pleasure. Today, many young people who have made enormous amounts of money are looking at art as another investment, as a commodity. And those of us who, who buy for passion, which I consider myself someone who still buys for passion because I love art, but I've studied art and my children and their friends say to me, how do we start a collection today? I mean, how do we begin collecting today when everything is exorbitant? And I say, look, and keep looking and keep looking and make friends with somebody, as you say, any, but everyone on this stage is an expert. We have become very friendly with Deborah and, and Larry. And I look at the people that he is that he has chosen to represent because I feel he's got a good eye. I also, I always relate it because I love to eat, to, to eating pizza. When you've eaten enough pizza, they all look the same. They're all dough and tomato sauce and cheese, but you can tell a good one from a bad one. And that's what happens with experience of looking. And so go to every museum, go to every gallery, Buy what you like. It'll never be a bad investment if you like it. And if you develop an eye, and who knows whether that's even possible today at these uh, prices to develop an eye, because we now have a global market. It's no longer you're going to France and buying the Impressionists, or you're going to New York and buying American pop art, or, or California. You know, we have some great artists here, Ed Ruscha and Deben Korn, and, and, and just a number of great young artists, Alex Israel starting here, Jeff Koons, who knows, it's global today. You know, everything is on the internet. People are buying art on the internet, and people are investing, using it as a commodity. But that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. And as far as directors go, mm -hmm. I have to boast that I think our director at LACMA happens to be one of the most brilliant visionary directors in the world today uh, having to do with museums. And we are in the midst of a $600 million expansion at uh, LACMA. 
a new building uh, to be built by Peter Zumter. And uh, I think he recognizes that the city center, our temples and our churches and our meeting places are going to be museums in the future. It's yeah. where we gather. It's where we teach our children history. It's where we get solace from all of the craziness that's going on outside in the world. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's a very good point. The, uh, when I was at IMLS, we did a survey, which the, has been repeated over and over again, and it showed that the two institutions that are the most respected by people in the United States, every kind of person, the museum and the library. So I think you're spot on. And I think the library has gone to Amazon, so I mean, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but Lucien, I'd, I'd love for you to comment, because the, the world of the auction house... Uh, and uh, these prices, my heavens. Yes, but, but the point I'd make first is that we're talking about contemporary art, yes. which by value is 75% of what is sold in the global art market. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that is that the other 25% is of masters and the wonderful things which are in, in Tim's museum. And actually those represent, in the scheme of things, bargains. So you can get a most unbelievably important, beautiful old master painting for a quarter of a million dollars which won't really buy you very much at all in the contemporary art market. Mm -hmm. So at Sotheby's, we sell everything from $5,000 up to hundreds of millions of dollars. But you shouldn't forget the bottom end is also exciting, and there is great stuff there as well, mm -hmm. particularly for people who have passion, connoisseurship, and who ask questions. Mm -hmm. And 70 um, or 80 years ago, it was the, exactly the other way around. Other so way these around. things can flip, not yeah. just m shift, but flip completely. A and they will flip again at well, some point. What, uh, Tim, what, what do you think, why did this happen? Why, why all of a sudden the flip to contemporary? I mean, are there I certain, since been, you're the historian, were there certain moments that? Well, this is, of course, it's the, it's the history we've all lived through. So in a sense, all of us can have views on how this has happened. Um, I don't think it's been, um, it's been a, a transition. I don't think it's been a sudden uh, movement, but certainly the fact that taste has tended to gravitate to more the culture we live in and what's being produced in our times, mm -hmm. that shift has been quite dramatic over the space of the 20th century. I think mm -hmm. for most collectors at the beginning of the 20th century, their image of great works of art and the things that were most desirable to collect tended to be historical material, not just of the last 10 years, but 50 years ago, 100 years or 500 years ago, collecting Renaissance works and so on. Um, I think the more modern culture has been a quickly moving phenomenon, the more uh, we are interested in art that reflects our life, our way, our style, and it's a way of living. Of course, a lot of the collectors today are buying art not so much because of the individual beauty and importance of the object, but the style of the house they want to live in. I don't want to call it decoration, it's more than that. But they want things that relate and work in a, as an ensemble, as a space to live in. And that trend has again pushed people towards the more contemporary, the more fashionable um, uh, work that's being produced in our in our moment. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, a sociological development for which there's be you know very complicated understanding or explanation. But I think it's not just a purely art historical or even a purely financial explanation. I think it's more about what sort of spaces we like to live in and what is seen as uh, epitomizing uh, that great style that of the moment that we we are now in. I, I wanted to, I'm going to turn to Philip in a moment. I wanted to make a, one tiny point. Uh, at the Folk Art Museum, we have what you would call traditional folk art, you know, going back. But also we have 20th century and contemporary work. Some people call it outsider art. At, at our museum, we call it art by the self-taught. We have found, and I'm sure uh, Timothy has found this too, when you feature some art or some artists, and they gain traction in a museum, the museum so soon finds that they can't afford to buy any of those artists if they come on the market. So the museum also ha you know, has a role, er, perhaps unwittingly at times, in helping to create a very strong, uh, strong market. Philip, I, er, I wanted to ask you, uh, the New Yorker magazine had an article recently where it called art, international art, some of it as being mobile art. And um, with the Panama Papers and all of that kind of stuff, I mean, what do you think? Where are we at? Um, it comes back to 
you know, during the wartime in the in, in the forties, people saw art as something that you could roll up and move with you if you were at times of crisis. Um, and I see people all over the world thinking, you know what, I'd like to have property, I'd like to have stocks and shares, but I'd like to have certain things that I can enjoy, and you can enjoy the art on the wall, but I can also move it very easily if, if I have to leave whichever country I'm in. Um, and yes, the Geneva Freeport is the biggest multi-billion dollar store of art in the world, uh, so there's a huge amount of art stored there. But then, um, but, but coming to the sort of, uh, the, I was on a panel with uh, Ru Nouriel Roubini, and he said, you know, what, what's awful about the art market is it's just full of money laundering, stealing, uh, you know, aggressive people um, making money out of, illegally out of the art market, and it's unregulated, and on it went. And I said, you know what, that's just so much rubbish, because when I was at Christie's 25 years ago, yes, the Italian mafia arrived with suitcases full of cash to buy old master paintings, because you were allowed to in those days. But that's all stopped. And um, now it's very, very carefully controlled. You can't pay for, for uh, more than $10,000 for a work of art in cash. The rest has to be a bank transfer. Now, the biggest collectors of art in the world are some of the most famous people that you, you and I know. Some of them are on our panel uh, this week, Leon Black, Stephen Co Steve Cohen, um, uh, and, and that's just to name a few. And, and, and so I think the whole thing of is, is it all about money laundering? Is there uh, anything devious going on? Like any world, there is always something devious going on in every market, the financial markets, and of course the art markets. That's why you need smart operators to be, who absolutely know the market inside out, to be advising you and avoid all these nasty pitfalls of what, you know, one or two things that we've been seeing going on in, the pa in Panama. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, do, do any of you see, uh, you, you mentioned old masters as sort of a, a bargain. Are antiquities on the market anymore? Yes. What, what is, um, what's available there? I mean, is it a it's, strong it's, market? It's a thinner market. Um, of course, everyone's more, more, much more aware than they were even 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, the importance of it, the provenance history, where it was, mm -hmm. When it left the the, the Explain country, Explain the origin. 1970 law because I think this would might interest. Well, the people. 1970 it's not actually a law, so, but it is the, a uh, principle. The principle. The, in 1970, UNESCO put out a convention, a statement about um, its recommendations for how to stop the illicit trade of um, material that had been illicitly excavated and exported from countries which are rich in archaeological material, the Mediterranean, uh, Latin American countries, but wherever. Um, and this has increasingly been seen as a date for museums to respect, um, so that we w would only buy something that was out of its source country by 1970. Um, it's not a regulation that applies, it's self-imposed, so it doesn't apply to private collectors, um, but it is increasingly a self-imposed rule on museums and the Getty and the LACMA and all the other major museums are part of this agreement that we, we want, will only buy works there where we can trace its, its provenance outside the source country back to 1970. I mean, we, we are one of the biggest collectors of antiquities. And just as a word of warning, buyer beware. It is a nightmare to go into that market unless you have the top experts working with you. The papers aren't always right. The pieces are not always right. They, there are all sorts of complications. Unless you have a top expert, a museum expert, and people digging into the real, who understand that market inside out, that's why something like the contemporary market is booming, because it's much easier to, to look at, understand, get to grips with, than if you go into a very, very complicated market like antiquities or, or old masters. They, they need top experts. You know, in, our, in our business, we have three experts in every sector, and there are about 70 different potential sectors in the art market. So you can go from watches and right. clocks to antiquities to tribal art to African art. And, and if you don't know what you're doing, don't touch it. And if you do get the right experts, it can be very rewarding. So our collector of antiquities loves it, but gosh, does he have to do a lot of homework before he goes into it. Before I ask for sort of some final, oh, did you want to say something? For final comments, I, I want to throw this open to questions, but Lucy and you, you want I, I to I was just going to say to yeah. Philip's point that, that it's a good thing that there are so many categories, because it means that our collectors have the opportunity to, to collect wisely and to collect what they love and also then to make good investments. Yeah.
So I, I would like to open this to questions. You have the experts sitting here. I know we have microphones, and if you could raise your hand and microphone could be brought to you. Shall we start? Let's start with this gentleman right here, and then we'll move that way. Sir, if you could, and also, here we go. And if you yeah. would, please use the microphone. I'm sorry. Do we have a sense of the total value of fine art worldwide? So vo volume of world art traded in a year is about $60 billion. That's the volume Trade. tra traded in a year, $60 billion. There are trillions of dollars of art yeah. in private hands still. Yeah. So we consider it several trillion. Correct. Okay. Yeah. okay. The gentleman here with the, okay. We'll do you and then the gentleman with the white collar. I, I recently uh, sold a painting and I put it on Facebook and I got many, many offers afterwards. And I was wondering, because the bidding went kind of crazy. People said, well, can I have that? And I got offered a million dollars from a painting um, from somebody. And I'm not sure what, it, it just seems a bit weird. And I wondered what causes people to make really large offers and to say, I want to collect you because it, I, I'm just sort of in a state of shock. And I don't know what to do with, with that. Do you sell things on Facebook? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a very large yeah. Facebook community, yeah. and I'm a best-selling author. I have yeah. a book that's number right. one on Amazon. Yeah. And people say, well, it's a piece of you, and of I you. like you, and you've yeah. done good things for me, so I want to support you. Uh -huh. But, you know, and I like the painting, but it's more about me. How does, how does that work? How do you translate the essence of a person into a work of art and then buy it? I mean, what's that alchemy? That is really not an art market question. Yeah. That's really an, that's sort of an outlier, I would say. Um, that you have uh, kind of an irrational exuberance, mm -hmm. you know, someone that wants a piece of your celebrity. It's sort of, that's sort of another thing. I don't I think it has. I don't think it relates to the art market. <laughs> Do you? Uh -huh. I would. I would just say you're very lucky. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. <laughs> I would say that's unusual. So so good for Go you first. that somebody <laughs> admires you so much that they're willing to pay anything for your your paintings. If you want to sell it, sell it. That's a great. Yeah. Deal. It's but it's true. Yeah. It, it, well, it's the idea. Like you bought something that was owned by the Medici's. I mean, it's a. So think of yourself as a Medici. All right. This gentleman right here. Do we have, can we have a microphone, please? Thank you. And then there's a, there's a lady. I think a lady in back. Yeah. So Ge yeah, I guess the general conceit of this entire panel is, you know, how do we balance the financial value of art and the other, you know, social educational values and. You know, Tim mentioned this about the difference between a passion collector and analytical collector. Um, and so I have a question really for people that have, you know, commercial directives, so namely Philip, Deb, and Lucian, which is, and I guess Deb probably has the most flexibility in this regard, but how do you balance the financial imperatives that you have, you know, on behalf of your company, especially it's a publicly traded company, with your role as an influencer in the art market um, and the additional uh, impact that that has on the cultural value of the market and the you know, general betterment of the people with whom you deal. Mm -hmm. We'll start with Lucy and then we'll go to Philip. I, I think Deborah hit it on the nail earlier when you she did. said that it's a relationship business. And so when it's to our shareholders' benefit that we have a long-term relationship with our clients and help them to collect over time. So, there's, so basically there's, there's a benefit in there's a benefit in selling over time, there's a benefit in education of our clients, and there's a benefit in building the market for our shareholders. And then you have any additional comment? And then this gentleman. Here. I mean, we, we, because as a fund we hold hundreds of millions of dollars of art, we lend it to museums free of charge, uh, to any exhibitions. So we're lending works all over the world. And we, all our clients, we encourage and organize. We organize one of the major museums and uh, shows in the V&A right now of one of the most important collections in the world. And so we'll lend, we'll, 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 we'll encourage them and we oversee the whole lending free to museums. Mm -hmm. uh, this gentleman over here. And then there are three people, four people, five people, and then we'll do a so the, summary. The title of the panel is about how to value art. And obviously financial instruments are really valued mostly upon cash flow. Uh, art doesn't uh, <laughs> generate a cash flow, so it's the ultimately story-based um, asset. Um, is the value of art simply a measure of its importance? Is it how you keep score of importance? And is it that subjective? Uh, well, it's a market. It's obviously, to state the obvious, it's a, the market's value of its importance. 
but I think one of the key things that could be said that distinguishes the art market from other markets is it's so much fashion-driven, particularly in the contemporary art sector, and which is why I think the nervous investor has to really think seriously with contemporary art, because you know artists can very quickly you know, reach the, the top of a cycle and then f just two or three years later be in a very different position uh, in market terms. Um, I, and I wouldn't, and the other, other thing I would say is, if you really are approaching this from a financial perspective, don't, f there's a lot to be said for the contrarian approach. What is unpopular, which is therefore undervalued, a lot of the great collections would be people spending very small amounts of money, buying it because they like it, they want to live with it, and the advantage is it's not so expensive. Um, a lot of the great collections have been created this way because if you're buying into a, a, um, a matrix which is valuing what is fashionable, what is popular, and therefore the prices have been appreciating, of course, at some point that cycle stops or goes in the other direction. So the risk factor of, of following the trend uh, can be, at times, you know, over the long term, can be a dangerous one. And there's a lot to be said for the counter, you know, uh, the, the counter cyclical approach of buying, being driven by what interests you, so that the value is, is at a level where you're prepared to take a loss if it does take a loss. But more often than not, you will find it has its moment later on. Can I, can I just add on the financial side? I mean, there's obviously straightforward the capital gain. For instance, we bought a Peter Doig in 04, sold it, bought it for 880,000 and sold it for a year later for two million. There's the lending of money against art. So we lend hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars against art and we charge an interest rate. The third thing is we underwrite the value of art at auction. So we're the prince of one of the principal underwriters of art and we take a fee out of doing that. that. That produces cash flow. So there are many ways, or you can rent out art, but it's not a very, very lucrative business. So that uh, perhaps summarizes. Okay. We have two final, this gentleman here and then the gentleman with, in the white shirt in the back. I'm just interested in the idea of a, a good collector. I'm thinking mainly in antiquities. I'm an archaeologist. I work for a non-profit using cultural heritage to bring benefits to local people. And I, over the last couple of days, I've heard about, a lot about impact investing, activists, philanthropy, people who want financial returns, but as well uh, social or cultural returns to what they're, they're doing. And we've heard about collectors, museums who do no harm, have the principles that they adhere to. But I'm wondering if there's, for investors, more options for people who want to um, influence the supply end of the arts. We've heard museums are cultural research, educational, economic assets for cities. But can collectors, in whatever form, do more to uh, influence the locations where art comes from, the communities around them, and the health of art and culture in general in the decisions that they make? Hmm. That would be wonderful. <laughs> it, 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 it would be. That the, the only thing we've seen is there are numbers of collectors who try to, try to work hand in hand with museums. So they will, they will collect with a curator from a museum with a view to donating an entire collection mm -hmm. to improve the life of their community. Uh, happens a lot in this country, but it also happens in England and in European countries. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen it so much with what archaeologists would call source countries. Um, and I haven't seen so many donations to, let's say, India or, or to it. Afghanistan. Can I pick up? Yes. Uh, Timothy Just would like to comment, one and then the gentleman in the back. Part of that answer is not private philanthropists, but museums, the Association of Art Museum Directors, has been active in trying to persuade the source countries to implement legal markets, legal processes where things can get export permits, can become part of a legal trade in antiquities, because the, the, the obvious alternative is when there's no legal market, things get pushed into a black market, and then we have the problem of illicit trade and, and looting of sites and so on. So we're advocating that change, but of course, the countries have to be persuaded to take those moves. Okay. And the yeah. gentleman in the white, and then this gentleman in front. So you yeah, first, um, I, I sit as a director of an uh, art house in uh, East Africa, and uh, we established ourselves a couple of years ago. Um, trying to promote East African artists and uh, trying to build the art market in East Africa. I just wanted to get some advice on, on what we can do. Um, I feel we need to play a little bit of catch up in the art scene in Africa. And just wanted to know what advice you have uh, for, for an art house like us. Uh, we've run a couple of auctions, we promote artists, um, 
we educate, but uh, it would be good to see what more we can do. Are you familiar with the African, um, the Smithsonian Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C.? Because not only does it have a historic collection, it's very involved with contemporary art in Africa. And I, my suggestion is that you get in touch with them, and I think they could maybe put you in touch with some people who could help you with what you're trying to work out. I, I don't know if there's anything else. Okay. I would just point out that um, for the first time in our last uh, Venice Biennale was curated by Okwi and Weezer, oh, yeah. who is African. And he uh, uh, put a lot of African artists into uh, that exhibition. And, and it, the whole world looked. And I think that we are seeing uh, Africa just starting now to come into the art market. And I think those kinds of curated exhibitions, if we're seeing more participation in art fairs, um, that's a good m place to look. I, I tell you what was interesting was that one of our clients bought an African head for $2 million about two years ago. And he said, how do I recoup my money? I maybe spent too much. And I said, let's sit down with the auction houses, work out why don't we put that African head alongside a Giacometti walking man or a sculpture and, and put it in the New York auction rooms right next door so that people can start to put contemporary art making hundreds of millions against something from the African. And lo and behold, this piece made a new world record price of 10 million because everybody looked at this and thought, that's really interesting. Um, to take this out of the, of, of the local market and put it into the international market and put it alongside something else. And it, and it, and it, it was a new world record price. Thank you. And one final question, this gentleman. Thank you. Would you please share with us how much you spent time to identify the zeitgeist artist? And if you identify it, do you share it with a broader audience or you keep it at your closest circle? Thank you. So how do we identify the, the I think the zeitgeist, is what you said, the zeitgeist artist? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, artists begin to ascend and come into your view in many ways. Um, there are, you know, gallerists that have very prestigious programs. People pay attention to these galleries and to the curation uh, in these galleries. Uh, things start to appear at auction. Uh, you, you, you compare and contrast the primary and secondary markets of an artist, meaning the price right out of the studio versus the price once it starts to sell for a second or third time. And you look for artists that you think uh, look fantastic, look promising. In my case, I, I always feel that there needs to be a practice 10, 15 years in the practice. And then if I think that artist is interesting, I would bring it to Larry's attention and hope to show the artist. I would not hide it for myself, my job would be to, um, mm -hmm. to exhibit it and push the artists forward in that way. So, we have come up to the end of this, I think, very informative and great group. I feel, as they say in the South, I've been in tall cotton with all of you. <laughs> and um, these are people you may want to buttonhole because they really are, uh, they are the experts. If you're interested in folk art, self-taught art, you can find me. <laughs> but these are, the, these are the people who really are in the market and I think can give you some great advice. So thank you so much, all of you.